Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the Grand Rounds today. Uh, I wanted to remind you that uh, we don't have a Grand Rounds pro uh, program scheduled for next uh, week. And uh, also remind you to uh, please sign the attendance log and also uh, fill out the program evaluations. And most importantly, give us any ideas in regards to topics or speakers. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to actually uh, reintroduce Dr. David Moore. As you may recall, Dr. Moore is board certified in uh, neurology, uh, sleep, uh, and uh, he is uh, fellowship trained and uh, also board certified in epilepsy, uh, in addition to being a member of the medical staff in the departments of neurology at MGMC in McFarland. He is an assistant adjunct professor of neurology at uh, Des Moines University. He has kindly accepted our invitation today to update us on migraine and tension headaches, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Moore. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and given this talk, I want to first give a talk thinking about migraine theories and other things. And then I said, that's too much information, and I can't put it all into two different talks. So I figured I would just talk about basic migraine and tension headache. And why migraine and tension headache? Um, because those are the most common types of headaches that people suffer from. Um, I should state that the topics for today are going to be the international classification of headaches. Most people are surprised when they find out how many different types of headaches there are uh, and how they're classified. He red flags to headaches. So when do you know that this is not just a regular headache and I need to do something sooner versus doing something later? What's the definition of migraine and tension headaches and how do we really separate them out? In my practice, I tell all my patients that all headaches are migraines until proven otherwise. It's just easier for me to do that. So I'm gonna give this talk kind of the way in which I treat patients, but the medicines that I talk about, instead of giving a biased opinion about what I think, which is not tested, I'm gonna talk about what headache specialists feel are the headaches medicine to use. And so if you don't see it, it's something that headache specialists around the country aren't using to treat headaches. And so if they aren't using these medicines to treat headaches, I don't think that we should be using these other meta medicines to treat headaches. Uh, diagnostic testing for migraines and for tension headaches, to be honest with you, there's none unless there's a red flag. And then the most important thing that we talk about probably are treatments for migraine and tension headaches. So that said, do I have any um, things to talk about in terms of what I do. So I've done research in terms of migraine headache protocols and in doing migraine headache trials. Um, I don't think anything that I talk about today um, is biased towards one company or another company, so I didn't put in any things about my talk, slides about being owned by this company or that company, if that's the way a person wanted to look at it. So question. How many different classes of headache disorders are there according to the International Classification of Headaches? You have those response buttons, 6, 10, 14, or 18. How many different classes do you think there may be? So there's actually 14 different classes. What's interesting about the 14 different classes of headaches is that they can be subdivided into four or six subcategories. So if you take six times 13, um, that would be 78 different types of headaches. But the 14th class are headaches that don't fit in any of the above categories. So there's more than 14 different classes of headaches that we look about. If we talk about headaches, um, which of the following symptoms are not associated with tension type headaches. So if we're gonna talk about migraine and tension type headaches, we need to know how do we separate the difference between them. Um, and it's really quite simple, but the question is, we have all these symptoms, so which is it? Throbbing, made worse by movement, nausea and vomiting, light and sound sensitive. All the above you can see with tension type headache, none of the above. Two and three, meaning made worse with movement or light and sound sensitive, or only four, sensitive to light and sound. And the audience says all the above. 
The correct answer here is none of the above. So light and sound sensitive can be associated with tension type headaches, but you can have only one or the other. You can have both. And and means both. So if you have light and sound sensitivity, it's a migraine. If you have throbbing component, it's a migraine. If it's made worse with movement and general activity, it's a migraine. So this is an interesting question. And there's four medications, amitriptyline, paroxetine, cymbalta, and candesartan. Which medication can be used to treat migraine, but not tension headache? Numbers are still going up. Interesting. So all these medicines can be used to treat tension headache except for number four, candesartan. So candesartan is an interesting medicine. It's an ARB, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, if I say it right. Help me out and turn us if I'm wrong that I found out probably 18 months ago can be used to treat migraine, uh, which kind of shocked me. Like, Cinepril can also be used to treat migraine. But these would be meds that we wouldn't normally think of as treating migraines. Um, amitriptyline, paroxetine, and cymbalta can all be used to treat tension-type headaches, but not candesartan. So we talk about headache classifications, and there are four basic primary headache syndromes, which are migraine, tension-type headache, trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, which would be cluster headaches. And cluster headaches have a lot of autonomic symptoms associated with them. And then other primary headache syndromes. Next, we have secondary headache syndromes, so those related to trauma or head injury. Cranial or cervical vascular disorders, so aneurysms, pseudoaneurysms, or artery dissections can cause headaches and have a variety of symptoms that can also be associated with migraine. Non-vascular cranial disorders, substances or their withdrawal, infection. So a lot of people think a lot of headaches are due to sinus syndromes or sinus problems. I will tell you in my experience, very few of the patients that I see have sinus-related migraines or sinus-related headaches. So I would say that sinus headaches should be put way down on the list when someone comes in with migraines or with headaches. Um, everything else there is kind of self-explanatory. The other classes of headaches are cranial neuropathy. So trigeminal neuralgia or glossopharyngeal neuralgia would be other cranial neuropathies that cause facial pains. Uh, and then there's, last but not least, other headache disorders. So what are the red flags? When should you say something's not right with this patient and it's not just a tension headache or not just a migraine headache? So number one, the first or worst headache of your life would be a migraine. So if you're over the age 25 and you all of a sudden have new onset headaches or it's the worst headache of your life, that's a red flag. If you've had headaches your whole life and now you just have another headache, it's just a regular run-of-the-mill headache and you don't have to get concerned about it. An abrupt onset of headache that's different than prior headaches that you've had. Progression or a fundamental change in a headache pattern. So let's say most women have more headaches than men, and those headaches are typically hormonal or related. So if you normally get a headache around your menstrual cycle, and now all of a sudden you get a headache way outside of that cycle, and it's different, that's a red flag, and that should be seen. But if it's your basic headache in terms of description and how it changes over time, it's typically probably your basic run-of-the-mill headache. Any new headache in someone less than five or over age 50. Personally, I used to use the term the age 25, but if I were to do enough reading, the reading would tell me that it's really if you have a new onset headache or a change in headache over the age of 50 versus 25. Anyone who has cancer is on immunosuppressive medicines is pregnant with new onset headaches is a red flag. Anyone who presents with syncope or seizure and following it has a headache and they've never had headaches before would be a red flag. Headaches triggered by exertion, Valsalva, or after coitus or sex would also be a red sign of a headache, red flag I mean. 
and then neurological symptoms lasting greater than an hour. What's interesting about neurological symptoms and migraine is that migraines flow or change and spread over the head, and you can have hemiplegic migraine or a migraine associated with other symptoms, and it's a migraine, it's not really a stroke. Um, typically, people who have these don't show up out of the blue. They've had symptoms before. Sometimes a person will show up where their symptoms are more than what they were before. And anything that's abnormal on your general or neurological examination should kind of trigger something of saying, maybe I should look into this a little bit more. So what are the types of migraines? You have migraine with aura, migraine without aura, chronic migraine defined as greater than 15 headaches per month, complications of migraines, those would be like migraines with neurological symptoms. This is an interesting probable migraine. So you have all the features that fit with migraine, but it doesn't push you into saying it's a migraine. And it's a probable migraine. That's where my comment says, everything's a migraine headache until proven otherwise. And then you can have episodic syndromes that may be associated with migraine. So this is the bottom line. The bottom line is, what's the minimal definition of a migraine? So you have to have at least five headaches that are migraineous in features in order to say a person has a migraine headache. Number two, headaches for migraines typically last four to 72 hours. And you must have greater than two of the following, unilateral, pulsating, moderate to severe intensity, and aggravated or causing avoidance of routine activity. So if you can't get out and walk and climb stairs and because of the pain, it may be a migraine. Tension type headaches, really don't limit your activities at all. Uh, nausea or vomiting is associated with migraine. In order to have a migraine, you have to have light and sound sensitivity. Just one doesn't cut it. So if a person comes in and they only have light sensitivity or sound sensitivity, it could be a tension type headache. And then this is another kicker when you look at the classification system. There's no better account for the the headache. So you can't find another reason for a person to have a headache, then you go back to say it's migraine. So this is what's interesting, and there's not a lot of research done on this topic, but a prodrome. And no one in this room has probably ever thought about it, but two to three days before you get a migraine, you may have signs and symptoms that you're going to get a migraine. Those signs and symptoms can be heightened sensitivity to light or sound or odors. Sleepiness or yawning, a good one is yawning. People will yawn a lot before they get a migraine. Food cravings, mental status changes or mood changes. Fluid retention, loss of appetite, or in fact, increase in appetite, constipation or diarrhea. These are like a bunch of nonspecific symptoms, but they can occur two to three days before a migraine. So we talk about people having foods that can cause migraines. So foods that can cause migraines, typically it's their metabolite or metabolism of those medicines or foods that cause migraines. So you eat something and two days later you get the migraine. So people who say that it, migraines can be diet-centered or diet-specific, that's true. It's important to remember though, it's very hard to prove. And the only way to prove that you have a dietary cause for migraine is if you go on a totally bland diet such as rice and then every week you add in one extra ingredient and see if you get a headache. Any other way of doing it, it's really hard to determine if that causes a migraine or not. Migraine auras. Migraine auras can be positive symptoms, meaning that you have something that's a positive symptom or negative. So vision changes is the most what, best way to look at this. So you see these fortification spectra, you see these bright lights, circling lights, or you see things getting smaller, things being big. Those are positive symptoms. A negative symptoms would be a hole in your vision where you can't see around something. Uh, that would be different from something where someone has a loss of vision in one eye. So a loss of vision in one eye would be something more serious and not necessarily associated with a migraine because migraines are hemispheric in nature and so you have something to one visual field that's absent or lost. Numbness, tingling, or paresthesias typically can occur in migraines. 
and they typically will start either in the mouth or in the hand and spread up or down the side of the body. May be associated with weakness or clumsiness. And then some people have speech problems or language problems with migraines. Um, none of these symptoms occur with tension type headaches. So about 36% of the people who have migraines have aura. And some people have auras but don't realize that they're auras. And most people never realize that they have this prodrome two or three days before they get a headache. Most auras are short, lasting 15 to 30 seconds. But that said, you can get your headache and then have the aura or the visual symptom after the onset of the headache. It doesn't really follow a particular pattern. Um, people can have just a migraine aura and never have a pain. So it's an acephalic or headache migraine without pain. If that's severe enough, a person may need to be on preventative medicine for migraine just so that they don't have the aura because the aura could prevent them from driving. So the next feature of migraine is a postromal syndrome. So it's interesting, you took a look at migraines and we never thought about it like this, but there's four parts of a migraine. There's this prodrome that can last two to three days. There is this aura that lasts 15 to 30 seconds and then you get a bad headache. Then there's a headache and then there's the after effects of the headache. And people get caught up in all of these and sometimes people will cycle where they go through it as soon as it ends the next one starts and they just get in this rapid cycle. So triggers for migraines, almost anything can trigger a migraine. And forgive me, I've left some of the things out of this, but hormonal changes can cause migraines. A headache and head trauma can cause migraines. Lack of exercise. Probably the biggest cause for headaches in general may be disruption of sleep. Various medications can cause migraines. And then stress can cause migraines or tension headaches. So what do you find in your exam when someone has a migraine? So it's not uncommon to find cranial or cervical muscle tenderness. It's not uncommon to find neurological symptoms such as a Horner syndrome. Although I would tell you if you find someone with Horner syndrome-like symptoms, you have a small pupil that's non-reactive, you have droopiness of the eyelid, or you have an injected eye, that person should probably be sent to the neurologist, especially if they've never had it before. Uh, to be seen for potential neurological problems. Tachycardia or bradycardia can occur during a migraine. Hyper or hypotension can occur during a migraine. And I go back again to complex migraines where you have neurological symptoms. So findings to suggest something else is going on, and I mentioned this earlier, is loss of vision in one eye can be amaurosis fruvax. Typically that's a blood clot or a thrombus that broke loose, went to the retinal artery, plugged it up, and then dissolves. And you're left with no vision in one eye. Temporal arteritis tenderness, particularly in someone who's over the age of 50, could be a sign of temporal arteritis. So jaw claudication, having pain increase with talking or with chewing would be some of the things that you would associate with temporal arteritis. Lethargy that's unrelated to medication. Now some people just, when they get migraines, they get sleepy and tired. But if that's their pattern for the past 10 years, it's not something to worry about. If it's something that's new and they've never had it before, then that's different. And then mental status changes. Whenever someone has mental status changes and they're talking weird or they're normally a jolly, friendly guy and now all of a sudden they turn and they're like the devil, really mean and irritable, that's an ominous sign and someone should be seen sooner versus later. So we talk about tension headaches. And before I transition to that, I should talk about migraines one other time. There's episodic migraine, like there's episodic tension headache. Episodic meaning that you have fewer than 14 headaches per month. Then there's chronic migraine, when you have greater than 14 headaches per month, or 15 headaches per month. And then there's chronic daily headache, or transform migraines, where you're having headaches every day. The same thing goes for tension headaches, as it does for migraines. Um, tension headaches, you have to have at least 10 headaches before you can say someone has had a tension headache. And they have to fit the following definition. Typically, they're bilateral, they're not unilateral. Typically, there are no pulsating or no throbbing component. It's just this constant boring ache, like you're wearing a hat two sizes too small, or someone's inside your brain trying to push out 
but there's no pulsating or throbbing component. There's no other neurological associated symptoms such as erythema or redness of your eye or droopy eyelids. The pain is never more than moderate intensity. So I have a pain scale that I use one to five. I don't believe in a 10 point scale. Uh, tension headaches aren't aggravated by physical activity. So you can go out and do most anything that you wanted to do. And you can have no nausea and no vomiting. The minute you have nausea or vomiting, it's not a tension headache. You can have light sensitivity or sound sensitivity, but not both. So I'll go back and just reemphasize the differences between migraine and tension headache. With tension headache, it's non-localized pain. It's non-throbbing. It's aggravated by activity. It's not a severe pain. It won't put you in bed. It won't make you a couch potato. It's not associated with other neurological features. No nausea, no vomiting. You can have light sensitivity or sound sensitivity, but not both. So what are the things, um, uh, the most common triggers for tension headaches are the same triggers really that are triggers for migraine. So you can't differentiate between the two based upon triggers. Um, smells probably do not aggravate or bring on tension type headaches. All right, case study. A 28 year old woman presents with stress headaches. She has fiercely been treated with general anxiety but report no ongoing issues. The headaches date back to her teens and have increased in frequency and intensity over the past year, coinciding with a job promotion and relocation. She describes bilateral attacks of non-pulsating pain that lasted 12 to 24 hours and occur once to twice a week. At times the pain reaches moderate to severe levels with some intensity, a light with some sensitivity to light and noise, but no nausea. She experiences significant tightness in her neck before and during the headaches. Her greatest concern was her need for occasional bed rest and associated work absences. Her exam was normal. She was seen in the ER and they did a CT scan of her head and it was unremarkable. And so the question is, is this a tension headache or is it a migraine? So migraine, 65%, you're absolutely right, it's a migraine. The fact that she has both light and sound sensitivity makes it a migraine. The fact that she's missing work makes it a migraine. So how do we look at headache management? So the best way to look at headache management, whether it's migraine or tension type headaches, is non pharmacal therapy should be the first thing we should consider. So number one, look at your, your potential triggers and try to avoid them. Sleep. I can't emphasize sleep enough. People who don't get enough sleep will get migraines. The question becomes, what's enough sleep? Some people get by with four hours of sleep a night. Some people need 12. Um, it's hard to answer that question, but sleep is really important for our bodies to refresh. Eating proper diet, exercise program, Exercise is the key for health, regardless of what you're doing. Exercise is very important for all of us. And it helps keep your mind fresh. It keeps blood flowing. It's a good thing to do. We should always do it. All of us should try at least three to four times a week, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, stress management. And the question becomes one of, what is stress? So stress are your kids. Stress are your parents. Stress are your friends. Stress are things just going on at work. Coworkers are stressful. So learning how to handle your stress is probably one of the other most important ways of avoiding and treating migraines. Unfortunately, most of us are trained to avoid stress, meaning that you have stress in your life, but you avoid it. Exercise oftentimes can help 
give you that release of the stress and help prevent you from having other problems. Passive physical manipulation. So seeing a chiropractor can be okay. Some people should not see chiropractors. Seeing a chiropractor means that the chiropractor should also tell you ways of doing stretching and other things you can do to help prevent you from having a recurrent problem. Um, self cervical stretching of your neck at work, taking a break from being bent over looking at a cathode ray tube all the time is another way of preventing stress and of treating migraines and preventing migraines. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy um, is a way of, of, of preventing migraines and biofeedback. So doing things like yoga is something that can help prevent migraines and or tension headaches. So Dr. Moore's rating scale for headaches. This is not studied in research, but it's something that I developed because to me, this is a functional scale as well as a pain scale. A 10 point scale is too big and too many choices. And people will come in and tell you, I have an 18. I'm sorry, the scale only goes up to 10. I know, but my headache's an 18. That, that just doesn't work for us. So my five point scale is one, you ask yourself, do I have a headache? Yeah, and you blow it off. That's a level one headache. A level two headache, it's there, but it's no big deal like a mosquito bite. You're 100%. A level three headache is you're less than 100%, and you think about taking a medicine, or you take a medicine. That's a level three headache. Tension headaches are level three or less. Based upon description, migraine headaches can be level three or more, but you can have a migraine with no pain, which means a migraine headache can be a level one. But the severity of it can go up higher. A level four headache is a couch potato, meaning that you can do the things that you have to do, but you would really rather just hang out on the couch. So you're less than 50%. A level four headache means that you're at home and in bed and you can't do diddly. You, can just, you, just, you can't do anything. So if you can go out and do something, it's not a level five. So I saw a patient yesterday. Well, I have this really high pain tolerance. And so I do things with level five. I said, no, if it's a level five, you can't do anything. So it's not a world comparison to other people. It's a comparison only to you. All right, so that's the problem with a lot of these headache scales or pain scales we use, is people try to attribute them to other people or the masses. But when we look at pain and treat pain, it's not how the masses look at it. It's an individual rating. So the next thing that I do is I have everyone keep a headache calendar. And so I say, at night when you go to bed, ask yourself, did I have a headache today? If you did, you rate it on a scale of one to five. And you put the number in the calendar. And you do that every day. And when you come in and see me, you bring your calendar. And at the end of the month, you add up all your headaches. So this person, if they added them all up, they had five level ones, three level twos, six level threes, four level twos, and five level fives, or 21 headaches per month. Now, to me as a neurologist and someone who's treating people with headaches, the headaches that are this big are just as important to me as this big. Most of the patients who we see, they are only concerned about headaches that are this big. My way of looking at this is when you get a headache that's a level one, it's no big deal. But then it steps to a level two. And then you start thinking about, is this headache going to get worse? And if it gets worse, what do I do? The minute you start doing that, you're no longer concentrating on being effective at whatever it is you're doing as being a mom, husband, wife, teacher, or at work. You're no longer effective because now your mind is displaced thinking about is this headache going to get worse? So the minute that happens, you don't think about it consciously, but you become less productive. And if you're less productive, that's not a good thing. So that's why I keep track of all headaches, not just the big ones. So when we talk about headache management, medications are used for headaches that are level three and above. People should not be using headache medicines if they have a level one or level two headache. Now that said, 
there's always exceptions to the rule. If I were to do a lot of reading and look at it, when should you treat people with headaches and not, and when are they overtreated? If you have less than four headaches per month, you can get by with an abortive medicine. If you have more than six headaches per month, tiny ones or big ones, you should probably be on something for prevention. So if we look at acute management of headaches, I'm only going to put in here things that have been stated in the literature that says these are effective at treating headaches. So the scale here is used is from the American Headache Society and the Canadian Headache Society. And so studies have been done to say these headaches, we have enough information that says this is a good medicine. Now the Canadian Headache Society has done one step further by saying that, yes, we have all this data that says this is a good medicine to treat headaches, but the complications that can arise from this medicine is bad, therefore it's going to be classified as being less than the other. Most of us will treat people with headaches with Tylenol, aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve. So the next person comes in and says, I've used all those drugs. They don't work for me. So it's easy. You can use a drug they've never heard of before, and it will work. Okay. So like ketoprofen or dichlorophenonate can be used to treat migraines, and most patients never heard of them. And so if you give them this and tell them it will treat their headaches, you'll be surprised how often it works. So in terms of migraines and migraine-specific treatment, studies have been done to compare treatment medicines for migraines and for tension-type headaches. And the importance to know the difference is that medicines that we use to treat acute migraines that are more expensive will not do anything for tension-type headaches. So triptans and muscle relaxants have not been shown to treat episodic tension headaches which is kind of bad. You would think that muscle relaxers would treat tension-type headaches, but they don't. The best thing to treat tension-type headaches is probably non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. The problem is if you overuse them, if you use them more than eight times per month, you'll end up with what we call headache rebound, where that medicine is no longer effective, and then you get worse headaches. The same thing happens when we use narcotic analgesics. Butalbital has, butalbital has been a uh, barbiturate within it, and people can become addicted to the barbiturate, uh, and they tend to get more rebound headaches, and they overuse medicines a lot. Um, so what medicines have been shown to be beneficial at treating tension-type headaches? Amitriptyline, chlorepramine, mirtazapine, venlafaxine, and a reasonable alternative would be tizanidine. But what's interesting about this is tizanidine is a muscle relaxer but it doesn't treat abrupt episodic headaches in a, a, as a, a preventative or as an abortive medicine, but can be used to treat as a preventative medicine. So the other thing about headache treatment is this, step care. And we all do step care differently. And I must be the first to admit that I am do step care in treating migraines inappropriately. So one way of treating patients is you say, take this drug, and when you come back and see me in six months or a year, if it didn't work, we'll discuss it then. Sometimes we give a person a med, but we don't give them a follow-up appointment to come back. Two, the second type of step care is, I'm going to give you this medicine, but if it doesn't work, in two hours, take this medicine. And then when you come back and see me in three months or six months, we'll discuss if it worked or not worked. The last matter part of, st of step care would be stratified care, which is what we all should be using, is you give a person a choice. So I get a headache that's a level two, I know it's not going to get worse, I would do X. I know it's going to get worse, so I should do Y, and the patient should determine which medicine that they should take for that type of headache and when. Because they're the one who has to live with the headache, they're also the ones who have to live with the side effects. So I think the stratified care where you give a person options of what to do when they get a headache is probably the best way to treat patients. All right, so now we go to meds. What's important about abortive medicines when we're treating migraines is their onset of action. And if you look down this list at their onset of action, sumatriptan acts within 15 minutes 
if you give it as a nasal spray or as an injection. If you take it orally, a tablet, it takes 20 to 30 minutes. And its T max is 2.5 hours. So when a person's going to use a abortive medicine, if their headache only lasts 60 minutes, it's kind of a waste to give them an abortive medicine because by the time the medicine kicks in, their headache is gone anyway. Two is, when should a person repeat the medicine if they're going to repeat it? So if you look at uh, naproxen, onset 30 minutes, peaks in two hours, My, and they say, what's the dose you should use for a migraine? 1375. So my approach for giving a person medicine for an abortive medicine is I would say you take this at the onset of your headache or when you know that you need the medicine. In two hours, you repeat it. Because I know that if in two hours it's not working, they need to get, take an additional dose of medicine to see if they can knock the headache out. It doesn't make sense to take a medicine if it's not going to knock out your headache. So if you look up here at sumatriptan, it takes 20 to 30 minutes to kick in. It peaks at two and a half hours. So you will repeat the dose then. The next thing to know is what's the maximum dose you can take in a day? So with the triptans, it's 200 milligrams, which would be two 100 milligram tablets, or two injections or two nasal sprays, or the equivalent, one injection and 100 milligram tablet is equivalent to 200 milligrams. One nasal spray with a 100 milligram tablet or an injection is also the equivalent of 200 milligrams. But the important thing, again, to note about abortive medicines that we're using in migraine is the patient may have expectations because they don't know what the half-life is and when the headache's going, medicine's going to kick in. And so if you give someone something and it doesn't kick in within, so if you give them almost trip, uh, no, you give them Frova, which onset is 120 minutes, that's not a reasonable thing. So Frova and nartriptan are used more likely than people who have um, hormonal-related headaches where they know they're going to get a headache and it's going to get worse. Using that where it's going to kick in later may be a better option. So this is really important. Triptans cause vasoconstriction. If something causes vasoconstriction, it can lead to a stroke or an MI. So we shouldn't be using, in patients who are at risk for stroke or have had a strokes or have had MIs or have coronary artery spasm, hemiplegic migraine, and other forms of migraine with neurological symptoms or even peripheral vascular disease, we shouldn't use triptans. This last sentence, uh, no one uses monoamine oxidase inhibitors very much. We use them in Parkinson's disease patients, but we don't use them that much. And so this becomes kind of a mute point in most cases today. But there are some psychiatrists who still use monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and we should just be aware of what those are and not give patients triptans. Um, and so when those little bleeps come up on epi, you should actually read those sometimes to make sure that you're not causing something different. Um, in terms of acute medicines, we always have patients come into our office and we'll give them a shot of this or a shot of that or they go to the ER and they get a shot of this or a shot of that. Um, there's level B evidence that says these medicines are effective. What's interesting is there's very little evidence that says valproic acid, tramadol, or steroids are effective as acute treatments for migraines. But we give them. Some people give IV levetiracetam also, but there's no data or very little data to support its use in the acute treatment of migraine. There's no studies that have been done. We do it, and I don't know why we do it, but it's just one of the things. So I'm going to hurry up along. Um, sorry. Uh, then there's these other places where we get really outrageous with some of the meds we use to treat migraines. Uh, so some people have been known to use Profavol and ketamine in the ER to treat migraines. I think that's going too far, and there's very little data to support its use. 
um, nerve blocks. So some people have used nerve blocks to treat acute migraines or as a preventative medicine for migraines. Nerve blocks can be effective, but there's not a lot of data that says they're effective. The International Headache Society and the American Headache Society do have a wing of neurologists who are doing these procedures, uh, and it's mixed reviews. Uh, I'm going to skip that. So there's a new class of medicines to treat migraines, calcitonin gene-related peptide antagonists. They come in two different classes. One class is you have these peptides floating in your blood, and these will attach to the peptide, so the peptide can't touch the receptor, or they will attach to the receptor. And what they do is they block vasoconstriction, so they stop blood vessels from constricting. And they stop blood, excuse me, I said that wrong. They stop blood vessels from dilating. And then we believe it's the dilation of blood vessels that causes the pain because the nerve around the arteries don't stretch, and that causes the pain. So these have been released uh, initially into the market in June with Irunumab was the first one released uh, in June of this year. Subsequently, about one to two months later, I can't say these names. Manizumab, it's either say Imgality and, and Abajoy. And these are very prominent on TV currently. If we look at the data in terms of treatment of these, and we look at data in terms of treatment with analinotoxin, toxin injections or botulinum toxin injections or Botox, this is what the data tells us, bottom line. Number one, if you look at the drug studies that were done to approve Botox, people who got Botox had nine fewer headaches per month. In the same study, people who got placebo had six fewer headaches per month. That doesn't sound like it's an effective drug to me. It doesn't sound like it's worth $2,000 every three months or $8,000 a year, right? It got approved because when they looked at the data at two years out, at 72 fewer headaches. So that means there's 72 more work days that a person could potentially have, and that's how it got approved. These newer medicines, if you look at the drug studies, what they showed was they decreased headaches by five per month. The placebo arm decreased headaches anywhere from 1.8 to 2.5 per month. So the difference is 2.5 headaches. But they're really expensive medicines, um, and they're geared and made just for migraines. The reason why this is put in here under acute therapy is at the time of me doing the talk, they were talking more about using these medicines as acute therapy for migraine versus preventative therapy for migraine. But in the process, they found out, oh, we can use these as preventative medicines. So they changed their studies kind of sort of in midline and started doing studies looking at long-term treatment as preventative. And so that's where the money is, so that's where companies are going. Um, in my experience with Botox, and I can tell you this because it's my experience, this is what I think and what I see based upon my headache calendar, but I've never put this together as a post hoc study, and maybe I should. Number one, 10% of the people who come to see me and get Botox every three months have a fantastic response. They go from having a lot of headaches to less than 10 headaches a month. In 10% of the patients, it does absolutely nothing. And I can talk those patients into stopping. 40% of the patients, they swear it's helping. If you look at their diaries, there's a marginal improvement in their headache frequency, but it's not really that robust. The other 40%, there's absolutely no change in their headache diary, but they say they have a better quality of life and are going out and doing things that they didn't do before. So I don't know how to look at that data, and I don't know how to tell patients, look, this isn't working, you need to stop. Um, so that brings us to preventative medicines. Um, I'm using this slide because these are only meds that we know of that we have clear data on that are effective at treating migraine. So there's a lot of people who are using other medicines. So people are using zunisamide, people are using levetiracetam, and other medicines to treat migraines, and gabapentin to treat migraines. But the data, and gabapentin is on this list right here, but the data that support their use in using migraine is really not that robust. People are using them because we don't have anything else to give people. 
Um, and that's really kind of sad. Uh, when we give people medicines to treat migraines, we should be aware that all these medicines have side effects. And the most important thing for me to tell you is the following. Topiramate and divalproic sodium are very good medicines at treating migraine. They work maybe 50% of the time. But in my opinion, they should never be used in any person or woman of childbearing age. So if you're age 14 to age 40, and you have, can have a baby, you shouldn't use those meds because they can end up in birth defects. And that's the last thing we want anyone to have is a birth defect. And so using those medicines wildly and throwing them out is probably malpractice, I would tell you. And you should think twice before just giving them to a teenager who may go out and be sexually active if you're not encouraging them to practice uh, safe sex. Does that make sense? So. I'll be quiet, I'll end there, and I'll answer any questions that people have. No questions? Oh, yes. David, are you still doing some of the clinical research studies for migraines? I am involved in several CGRP studies currently. Um, one is closing out and one is starting up. Uh, CGRPs are going to be the newest thing on the block and there's going to be at least 10 of them out on the market, either given orally or as an injection within the next two to three years. So currently there are three on the market, but that's going to rapidly change by December. Other questions? All right, thank you very much. Have a great Easter.